to welcome to an amazing episode of the barber shop suraj suraj i keep i keep kind of your name is i'm so used to calling you suraj it's a different root like swaraj is self governance suraj is good governance okay s o o r n s u s u s e u she's like suresh to suraj i had a slightly different ego trip when i was in the 11th and 12th that i don't study and i was like oh god where have i come so i was born in africa i was born in tanzania but grew up until i was 12 in zac in zambia and he's like well your number one job as a boy is to go and earn money for the family so the more you earn therefore the more of a man you are right that kind of, <laughs> that's the programming so civil disobedience is a bit out of place man right 75 years after independence it is our laws if we either we change them or we learn to abide by them No one plan for World War One. No one plan for World War Two. Would you rather have a world where the U.S. dominates or somebody else dominates? They'd probably pick the U.S. Yeah. Jobless growth is a reality around the world. And I was the I was the first Indian to be elected on the on the European continent. Welcome to an amazing episode of the Barber Shop. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have someone, and I'm before introducing you, I'm going to tell about my first interaction with you. I I, I don't know that I ever told you about this. I was telling Ritika and Marie before. So guys, then me. <laughs> so this was a seven a.m. breakfast meeting, which uh, because of Suraj's tight calendar, this was maybe three or four years back, and um, uh, we were meeting at a at a at a restaurant in a hotel. So it was a one of those breakfast situations. It was seven in the morning, and I showed up on time. Uh, and Suraj was already there, and I think before we got our plates. the the person who was serving came and asked both of us nicely ki some ha- hot coffee or tea or you know like a fresh juice we said i have a large glen livet on on the <laughs> on the rocks and this, this is the first thing i heard you say after we spoke on whatsapp so i didn't know whether he was serious or not and even the guy was like and you 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 being you now that i know you better you let that awkwardness hang for 5 7 seconds where and you looked at me and you're like hey Shantanu, what about you? And I'm like, am I? I'm like, okay. For me, like you know, senior partner from McKinsey, like, should I like kind of be kind enough and say yes, me too? Or and the guy was like, sir, the bar is not open yet. And he he kind of fumbled between the bar is not open yet and the bar closed a few hours back. <laughs> he did not know where seven in the morning light. But that was my first interaction afterwards. Of course, I got a news to Suraj. I was joking. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Of course you were. But out of five minutes, like, I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. And we were like both of us, like the guy and we were like, okay, cool. We can go for. But uh, we have Suraj uh, uh, Morje today with us. Many many years at McKinsey and Company. Uh, was then the CEO at Quest, which is the largest employer in India and a public company, which I want to talk about. Uh, you know, I'm always fascinated by uh, public companies and how how to manage boards and how. to kind of run such large enterprise and you know kind of in their institution in their own way and today is doing a lot of work across education climate and just being uh, you know the most awesome funny uh, inspiring human being uh, who you know kind of uh, is so contagious with this i'm hoping the next few hours for you will be uh, just as fun for you as they are for me but suraj suraj i keep i keep kind of Your name is. I'm so used to calling you Suraj. It's a different route, and the thing is, you know, I spend more than half my life outside the country. Huh. So most people think I'm just putting on an accent on my own name, but my mother actually did intend for it to be Suraj, which is good governance. Like Suraj is self governance. Suraj is good governance. Okay. Which she just spelt it S U R A J. Huh. The unsuspecting Mangalorean who didn't realize that <laughs> most of India will see it and say Suraj. For her. But you sp- spell it either S O O or an S U. S U. S E U. She's like Suresh, to Suraj, but you, a double E would have made. That's very easy. But he says I stubbornly insist R A J is Raj. <laughs> but I suppose in hindsight, it didn't. But even for me, for example, like I'm a Maharashtrian, so the way my name is pronounced is Shantanu. Oh. Yes, Maharashtrian pronounced, but Hindi speaking people always pronounce it as Shantanu. So Shantanu and Shant. But if you ask me what my name is, and if I'm introducing myself. I typically would say Shantanu Desh. Oh, interesting. I've never uh, really heard that. Yeah, Shant. If like Shantanu, but if I'm with the like three words, doesn't trouble you? Something. No, no, no. I'm completely okay. Because the the word apparently has many meanings, but is universally known as the person who started the the King Shantanu who started the Mahabharat. Oh, what is Desh Pandey? So, so I, I've actually thought about this late at night. The accountants, no? The accountants. Desh Pandey means. They spoke and Desh Pandey were the accountants of the. So it's not Desh like country. No, maybe it is. Because at that time the kingdom was 
considered desh right? it was not national but it was about who tells us king yeah deshmukh and deshpande but my account skills kind of <laughs> i i don't i don't live up to the name at all match kids my son is still working on the math for me i'm hoping by the end of this conversation he has expected number of noodles and things but uh, thank you so much for making it to the baba shop i just give you some context about the baba shop i think we started this as an extension of what i would talk about on linkedin which is entrepreneurship um and we would get senior leaders entrepreneurs ceos um investors to talk about their experiences and one thing that they realize is everyone's life story is so different everyone's uh perspectives are so varied but there are always commonalities that kind of string through all of them right um and what we want to distill out of a conversation like this for our viewers who are younger people who are kind of really looking for inspiration to jump the fence and become and do something of their own i think this is and we spoke about this in in the lead up to this uh, to this conversation around how india is going to shape up over the next 100 years and how becoming an entrepreneur or being entrepreneurial is going to be so critical to today's youth so for us we realize that a lot of people watching are there and are looking for inspiration to jump and we feel that after this conversation even if one person even if one person says okay i'm going to do this i heard suraj say these three things and they've touched a chord with me and i want to go and kind of do it um we'll consider this to be super successful but the idea is to just kind of go through your journey and distill things anything that you say uh, we'll always kind of there is always anything uh, freedom uh, so you can uh, you should just forget that there are cameras in the room ha ah, there nothing and uh, second thing is you can ask me questions as well it's a conversation it's not an interview it's a conversation so if there are things which you feel like bombay shaving company or me can have a perspective on very happy to build it up as well but um, tell me about your uh, you, you, you said you watched pramat and toshan on you know as i don't know as preparation or you saw it because you you knew them at the time what was your what was your fee- and you saw you know mr chaudhary and akash for a bit so what is your you know kind of view of the baba shop with these limited data parts so i must say maybe maybe i uh, i'm too old or maybe it's just that two years ago i um uh, uh i moved all social media icons mm. off my home page in my phone and then i moved all news icons off my home page on my for early and it's really saved me hours every day because i just stopped pressing those buttons just so i actually don't follow social media that much uh, so i was telling you so first shout uh, shout out to yes samika chander <laughs> <laughs> uh because i heard about this first from her huh. she's like you know shantanu oh my god he's a cult figure it's like shantanu yeah shantanu really wow you almost had glen limited at <laughs> seven in the morning out of your fear <laughs> uh but um but i have been i have been uh, following snippets along the way I've, but i watched uh, yeah i did watch all of potion and all of pramat uh, both people I, i i like a lot pramat i have a lot of lot of respect for in particular given everything that he's built in his life i really enjoy the conversations i must say i think you have a very unique style of talking to people and you try and the interesting thing is you try and make every person that you're talking to look good yeah. but that's also your personality you're a very generous person and you always give and i think this show is very giving in that sense uh, so i'm just so happy to be here well, thank you so much uh, and big shout out to samika as well i remember when we I, i was actually at the bombay airport you were in some airport i was at an airport i was at the bombay airport i remember and i got a video call from you so i was like this is rare i was like i must pick up and see what's going on so I, i think i was just before security or something so i was like hold on and i picked it up and you were like and and then you were like hey but, but this is a teenage girl who has <laughs> never thought i'm cool ever partly <laughs> because i'm her father's friend so suddenly she asked me you know shahz desh pandey you know my ticket to coolness yes yeah? so obviously i'm going to call you and then and then your colleague is valadeka yeah so my colleague deka also veeran veeran singh was like she's a big fan she was very excited i'm so happy and by the way when i now at airports i do have at least two to three people actually more four to five people per flight uh from source to destination and along the flight all three put together four to five people who come and take selfies how does that feel it feels very good to be very honest it feels very good because i feel, not because the obvious answer is because it's a ego trip which it is to some extent but more because i feel like 
I feel like this is now becoming um it started as a marketing property for Bombay Shaving Company and I think now it's becoming a lot more and it's really having impact and if you just go to the episodes and see the comments which people put I just feel okay fine we're touching a lot of lives and we're giving inspiration to a lot of people and for me it's so much fun like this is so much fun I, I would not this is like from a return on investment and return on time standpoint. I could not imagine, you know, anything being bigger than this. So for me, I just feel really good. I feel really, really good. I think you should. And it comes down to your, like what we discussed around, around when, when I asked you, what did you want this conversation to be around? And you said, I want it to be around purpose. And very classically, you said, hey, I have some notes. And I, <laughs> I knew you would. <laughs> Which you very diligently got here. I don't know whether you saw, I had edited an episode of The Barbershop with my dad. No, I have not seen My dad had had like six or eight pages of printout notes which he kind of kept around him, which he referred to and stuff. And yeah. I must watch that. <laughs> was, and that episode was actually not about entrepreneurship, even though he's an entrepreneur. He was CEO at Tech Mahindra. I remember that. Yeah. Then he started his own company with Praveen. Right, 14 years. They sold, 14 uh, trees. No, not 14 trees. 14 trees is what Praveen does now. But they started Airtight Networks out of the US oh, I for that. They were doing that together. Yes, they were co-found. That's how my dad knows him. Yeah. They did that. They sold it in 2019 and now he does a lot of this angel investing and so So he's an entrepreneur through and through. But that discussion was all about politics, government and India. And then he had a lot of notes about and he, when you talk to him about like Nehru and Shastri and Indira Gandhi and so on, he genuinely, the way he talks, you will feel like he was a cabinet member himself. Who knows that much he's written. More than that, I think it was a passion. I don't know about, like knowledge of course is there, but I think just, it was, it's all first person. It's all very first person. So he was uh, just as prepared as you. But thank you so much for kind of putting down your thoughts. I, I was thinking hard about how to navigate this conversation and just like we did with, with the episode before this. Chronology is an easy thing to do. Like how did it start and what did you learn? But I think with you, I wanted to actually kind of jump ahead and mm speak about the second bucket of things that you wanted to talk about, which is where is the world? I know it's a heady and uh, complex piece to start off with, but I think that's a great segue into talking about McKinsey, Quest, Eka and everything that you're doing. But you said something very interesting, which is the next, you asked me which is the largest city in India in 1500. Um, and then you asked me a second question, which is, do you know that the next 60 years are going to be very different from the last 60 years in ways that no other 120 year period has had that kind of change. But let's go deeper in that into why you feel what you feel and what 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 are your thoughts on how we should prepare for the next 60 Not only me, but maybe people like Manan who are much younger and you know our crew is probably in their early 20s. So you said geopolitics, you said demographics. A lot of things, but let's let's kind of go into that a little deeper. And where, where where do those thoughts come from? These are obviously so. These are ideas that I feel very very passionately about, and I think partly the you know the part of the reason for for launching Eka, and as I as a as a parent, I bought a boy who's sixteen, a boy who's thirteen. We're trying to prepare them for the world, and trying to understand you know what what will the world look like for them when when they grow up, and how do they prepare themselves best. You should tell people what Eka is in like a couple of seconds. We'll go into it in detail. Okay. But yes. So Eka is a is it's a very very small not for profit uh, fellowship that we've recently launched, uh, run by Hiran, the, the, yeah. the lady you were talking about earlier. Um, but um, effectively, you know, it's it's come out of a realization through my career. I spent some time in McKinsey, South Africa, where I led some of our work on affirmative action there. It's a realization that meritocracy is a myth. Um, in that we tell ourselves that the world is a meritocratic place, but you know, you and I are children of privilege. Like right? we won the ovarian lottery, lucky yeah. sperm club, whatever you call it. We, we we won that. Yeah. Um, by virtue of our parents being educated, possibly our grandparents being educated, uh, the chance to learn English fluently, and therefore the opportunity to compete. Right. We had the opportunity to compete. See, what I learned in South Africa is that if you've not had this background, you actually start with almost both hands tied behind your back uh, because you cannot compete. You don't have information to compete. Uh, I think our children learn about the world through school, but also when uncles, aunties come home and they have a and they talk about what do you do and where do you work and why do you do what you do, that's actually education. 
happening right there in our living rooms through through friends and family, which children from underprivileged backgrounds don't have. Correct. Um, and I think one of our realizations has been that where a lot of them get lost is in the transitions because there are many people who work with them, say, through high school, trying to help them improve numeracy, literacy. There's people who fund their education in college. But every time they jump, it's a whole new world. Yeah. Nobody at home they can go back and talk to to help them settle in, to give them advice on how to thrive. I felt that way when I went to IMA. Yeah. Uh, I knew nobody was there before me. I had no one I could call to say, what do I do here, right? Now, again, I think it's, there was a lot two hands tied behind my back. It's maybe one finger tied to another. It's a very small disability. But I still felt it acutely. Yeah. So the idea of Eka is to pick so how, how how did you decide to go to IMA? Like, did you just kind of give the exam and find yourself there? Or is it like kind of someone who taught you how to... No, I think pretty much. So uh, I went to REC Surat. I know you're from REC Nagpur. Nagpur, yeah. These are also ran RECs in those days. Um, everyone who went there was like, I didn't make it to IIT. Uh, I had a slightly different ego trip when I was in the 11th and 12th. I did not study. Uh, and then I came, so I came to REC Surat and I was like, oh God, where have I come? Um, and in my very first semester, I don't know, you're a lot younger than me, but in our very first semester, college got shut down because we had an infestation of the plague in Surat. Are you serious? Yeah, that's the, I think the only post-independence plague pandemic we've had in epidemic in India. So we all had to go home. Literally, they shut the college down for two months. And I came back, I was like, where am I? Like, <laughs> where am I? What am I doing? And I remember, actually, I remember failing in maths in my first semester. I think I was just so upset and so, like, just kind of unhappy with the world. And then a senior kind of called me to his room and said, listen, you have two options. You can sit and feel miserable about where you are or you can do something about it. And that's your choice. And I was like, yeah, it actually makes sense. So I think mm. that's when I sort of pulled up my socks and got, got back in the game. I think IME was very straightforward. It's if you're, uh, if you're an RIC Surat, either you take a job, and the job I got was as an IT engineer at Tata in Unisys. How that was this. Uh, or you did an MBA and tried to get a higher salary. And frankly, I was brought up in a family um, which has very, very the middle class values, right? So my dad was a teacher, physics teacher. And he's like, well, your number one job as a boy is to go and earn money for the family. And if you don't do that, you're nothing. Mm. So the more you earn, therefore, the more of a man you are, right? That's, <laughs> that's the programming. Um, and so it is all about, okay, let me see if I can get into IIM Ahmedabad. Mm. And then when you get into IIM Ahmedabad, there you're told, hey, if you're really a man, <laughs> you go to McKinsey. Yeah. <laughs> so then that's the race. And so one does it. In those days, I didn't think at all about values and what I value and purpose. It was just like very clear. Your father has told you, Economics earn, you know, keep your family safe, and that's that's what. You, so anyway, so coming back to Eka, huh? So Eka, I think is just. Um, so I think the the realization we had is if we really want to help young people, it's not so much money they need, but another caring adult in their lives who can give them exposure. So what we're doing is we've identified we're identifying every year. We started with our first cohort this year, children who finish the eighth going into the ninth. These are all from underprivileged backgrounds. Uh, who's not had real opportunities. And our commitment to them is we will stay with them until they get their first job, helping them navigate career, helping them navigate life through the transitions. Okay. Uh, so in the ninth and 10th, what we'll really focus on is helping them understand different professions because literally a third of them want to be cricketers, a third of them want to be engineers, and a third of them don't know, mm. right? Uh, well, Engineer slash IAS office. Yeah. Then that's really the horizon they've got and some medical. Right? That's about so it's really sort of helping them understand this is what a marketeer does, here's what a finance person does, getting them exposure to various professions so they can make a choice at least at the end of the tenth. The, the real choice they have to make is science, arts, or commerce. Correct. And which college do I shoot for? Correct. And often that choice is made by them, by their principal, after the results come. Because they've never even been informed that this is a choice you have to make. And by the way, there are real options that you can explore here, right? Uh, and then after that, helping them make a choice on either professional college or other colleges. Um, uh, we're helping them with spoken English. Uh, in India, your accent is a giveaway of your class, unfortunately. Yeah. Because our primary schools are so varied in um, in quality of teaching. Uh, so we're helping them speak English better, read and write better. Uh, we're helping them be more confident in their bodies uh, through theater as a medium. And you've got some amazing partners yeah. working with us there. Um, and that's the idea to really stay with them 
to get them to good life outcomes and career outcomes and hopefully i mean we'll see where it goes how do you select how do you select kids um so we've worked with uh, four partner ngos uh, dreamer dream tfi parinam balutsa okay they have nominated kids the only two criteria we've had is number one parents have to be supportive and committed to helping them to letting them finish their education so okay. getting them married or um no getting them married or into the workforce or into the workforce early and the second is these kids have to have proven that uh that they will take grab opportunity with both hands um we got a few more nominations than we needed so we literally used a lottery to pick the final for really except we cut it make sure we correct it for gender so 50% boys 50% girls 20% minority religious because we want this to be a reflection of society so they can grow up and learn together uh but no i I've still not seen their mark scots hopefully next week when i go back we have them i'm not seeing the i don't know the academic performance uh the idea again being that if and 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 you know, i was pushed by sucheta but from dream a dream she said if you're picking the cream based on merit then why do you help anyway yeah. they, they will be fine yeah. the question is can the average kid do well do better amazing but let's come back to uh let's come back to your thoughts on the next and why do you think the next 60 are very different from the last 60 so you know i think so so first of all human beings have a confirmation bias right yeah. so we see patterns around us and we just assume that whatever has been happening will keep happening that's why musical chairs is such a difficult game because you keep going around in circles and you don't really expect the music to yeah. happen but when it does you get taken by surprise that's i think true. i think if you look at um, if you look at the work way the world has played out right uh since world war 2 I think that there has been uh, an unusually calm period of time uh driven by let's face it the west had all the big weapons they used the big weapons really recklessly and they were like oh crap we really kind of screwed up and I think they've all in 1945 said gosh we have to correct we have to yeah we've got to reconfigure this and behave differently and then came the end of colonization then came the united nations then came the current global order rules our boundaries are recognized based on realities of 1945 and you know that era at all too um and based on power equations of that time correct right? so everything has been defined in the world as we know it uh in that period by the people who had power then yeah um i think a lot has now and i think that has given us a period of huge amounts of stability of course there's pros and cons but huge amounts of stability uh uh lots of people pulled out of poverty uh in general you know kind of much higher quality of life fewer maternal deaths you know you look at all the human development metrics the world is done really really well Correct. but i think there's a few things that are changing quite fundamentally now right i think one on just take the geopolitics itself so we're talking about 1500 and yeah. which was the largest city in india in 1500 by the way the second most populous city in the world was the vijayanagar city right the city from the vijayanagar empire is called vijayanagar destroyed soon after you know what the number 2 was actually a city in calcutta in india the number 2 largest most populous indian city is in the border of india and bangladesh is called gauda i had never heard of it until i read about it right so vijayanagar and then gauda is it gauda next to calcutta and the third was katak and on south right so it's it's a bit strange because our history the way we hear it is so delhi centric right? but yeah. if you actually step back the facts are A quite fifty hundred is fifty hundred is not long back. It's not. It's not long ago. Like fourteen ninety eight is when Vasco da Gama got to India, right? It's around that time. Wow! And at that time, seventeen of the top twenty cities in the world were in Africa and Asia by population. Really? What were they like? Would you remember what? Like, uh, the top would have been Beijing. The second was Vijayanagar. The third was Cairo. This fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. and then you had the start of colonization the growth of western powers fast forward to 1945 about 7 of the most populous cities were in africa and asia of course the us had come up as a huge power in the meantime and you had new york as number 1 correct i think tokyo was still number 2 and london was number 3 right correct but then you had all these european cities under it too um and that was the end that that, that was the result of 400 years of colonization mm-hmm. correct Where resources were were taken out so center of gravity moved completely right. moved i think if you take the making the done this analysis of what the on the economic center of gravity of the world like if you take like if if you take a map of the world and put weight according to the gdp ah uh, the 
center of gravity in the 1100s used to be somewhere above China. Who oh, is it? And it literally moved to London by 1450. Sorry, by, by 1950, right? And now it's slowly coming back because I think as the hangover of colonization ends and we all had a really bad hangover. Yeah. I think it took us, it took, it took colonized countries years to get back on their feet uh, in the context where the world <laughs> order is set by Western powers and so the rules are according to a completely different culture, not our culture. Correct. And we're sort of learning to cope and we've seen now growth, right? And you start seeing that it's coming back and and there's clearly a push to say, well, we need to do a multi, you know, the world needs to be more multipolar. There's going to be a bit of a tussle Right? Will the West give give up its its Security Council permanent seats graciously, or will there be a fight? Will the U.S. and China get into a fight, a real war, all up in the air? Where will this Russia Ukraine thing go, all up in the air? So there is, but there is a real likelihood that that sometime in the next fifty years, the world order will change, peacefully or otherwise. We don't. There's a lot of this. A lot of this is now becoming commentary, which, for example. Someone who is not a historian or someone who is like a lay person is also starting to understand. So, people have said in the Russia Ukraine situation, and, and because of YouTube shorts and the thing, a lot of the information is all figurative, right? A lot of people have said India and China have like kind of stood by Russia while the West has kind of demonized them completely. And there is a certain amount of, there is a certain amount of narrative which is very strong globally that. India and China will stand by their allies because of certain reasons. Like, for example, India won't stand by the US because of what happened in 1971. Yeah. Um, and Russia has been a far more reliable ally for India from India's perspective. So that, I think you're right. I think, and, and now it's now becoming common person knowledge. A lot of these things sometimes rec- are remain so exclusive to the well, well read and to the historians, and they don't really. History, that's why history, which is very dated and specific, does not affect the present as much as it should because very few people know about it. That's but right. in this case, you're right. A lot of this is now becoming very public. Especially with Ukraine, Russia, with sort of China, US. And by the way, the, I mean, the real question, there's many unknowns here, right? I don't think anybody knows where it's going. What happens if India and China go to war? What position will Russia take? What position will the US take? And who will stand behind whom? Um, right now, in that context... We are sending a million kids out outside our country every year for education. A million kids, but under a million, 800,000 right now. It will soon be a million, right? Uh, That's a large number. When Japan invaded Pearl Harbor, all the Japanese in the US were put in detention centers because they were Japanese and the US didn't trust it, right? So what happens in this area in, in, like, if something drastic goes wrong? like What happens? Where do you want to live? Where do you want to be? What happens if we have a war that kind of is 4x as disruptive as the pandemic, right? I, I think it has a real bearing on. So we spent a lot of time. I spent more than half my life outside the country, but I still keep my passport. But I feel at the end, I am Indian. I feel Indian. And I want to be in India in this time, right? I think it's a great place to be. Yeah. But I think that this the thought in the last 50 years has been like, go anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter. You can fly back whenever you want. And but the world is only getting smaller. I think it's about to start getting larger. You think so? I, I suspect so. Let's see. Individual country politics is also kind of heading in that direction, right? More strongmen politicians, uh, less focus on, you know, globalization. If you look at indicators on global trade seems to be sort of reversing a little bit the last five, ten years. So so we'll so that's one. But I think also if you combine with that, the political politics at every country, right? Inequality uh, is going up. Um, again, I think World War II was a great leveler. Um as they say, the you know the the biggest agents of for for equality are war, revolution, disease, uh, and social unrest, right? Because they kind of wipe out capital. Correct. Uh, and in the in this era of peace, we've had growing inequality, especially since 1980, because capital has gone up. Because capital has gone up, and people on top are making more money because the return on capital is higher than GDP growth rate, right? So, uh, and we're starting to see the effects of that around the world as well. Uh, so what will happen? Do we have the next Karl Marx or French Revolution sort of type movement in politics? Or do the rich cede more and say, okay, we will we will allow wealth tax and we will transfer more of our wealth to the government so they can do more for poor people? I think that's also left to be seen. But this post-80s era of low tax, you know, you kind of, you're a capitalist, you make what you got, you know, you worked hard, it's, it's a meritocracy. 
uh, I think that is going to start being we question quite a bit from a from a geopolitics perspective for sure. I I did see an interview with Kishore Biyani on on Nikhil Kamath's podcast and he he framed it beautifully. So inequity, I think, financial inequity in the US is obviously a lot starker than it is in India, right? But even in India, he said there are three Indias. Uh, he said, and I did the three, four founders, and see, like, we, this is the top 30% of India, right? Which is people who are better educated and higher, um, have a job, some kind of job, some kind of financial stability. And he said that um, uh, disease in the household does not change the financial status of the household unless the disease is extreme. That's how he defined India 1.0, right? Then he said India 2.0, and he said it very, like, very straightforward. He said, is like our, our maids and drivers and you know that class of people uh, financially and India 3 is rural and struggle for 3 meals a day live life day to day to day he said India 1 prevents money from coming to India 2 India 2 because of that behavior of India 1 prevents money from going to India 3 how, why, how prevent? I think you don't pay like or you don't, you don't pay enough you know you don't pay. Like, I live in a society where uh, people, when, when the family of four goes for dinner, it's easily a 10 to 15,000 rupee affair. Easily. And this yeah. is a, probably a twice a month. Yeah, if you're going to like a expensive hotel. Like, that's an hotel you go, you, and people can afford it. Yeah. But when it comes to giving Diwali gifts to the driver or the maid, every 100 rupees Counts. hurts for some reason. No, it's, it's very interesting because the only real peaceful transfer of wealth to the poor uh, has actually been done by Franklin Roosevelt uh, in the 1930s okay. for what they call the New Deal in the US. Okay. Right? Because he realized he'd had the, the the 20s, the depression correct, bottoming out of the of the of the of the low end. You had the robber barrels in the top correct. who made lots of money, and we have a few of our own people on top who made a lot of money. Correct. Uh, and he basically then he introduced concepts like minimum wage. Uh, he pushed for higher taxes on on on, on, on the rich. He actually pushed for higher unionization. Uh, and I sometimes wonder, in the context of India, uh, where a lot of our labor hiring is becoming very fragmented. Yeah, we need more unionization. Is it time to give labor a little bit more of a voice voluntarily? Yeah, because it will drive up wages and make sure maybe it will drive inflation. Maybe it means that companies make less money, but maybe that's a peaceful and gentle way to actually ensure a little bit more wealth transfer. I think so. I think one is one. You're right. I think organizing of labor is one, whether it's through unions or whether it's uh, through government. Like there are two, at least two obvious ways to do it. But I think it's 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 important to do it because uh, unlike the 30s of the US. We're in a stage where, and you probably know this better than anyone else, where supply of people is still way higher. So, when when supply is higher, then demand can go into abuse, right? I don't know if you saw this whole HDFC Bank episode recently. No, I missed it. There is a there is ah, you're not on social media or on news. <laughs> this is probably all over. There's a there's a sales head in HDFC of some region maybe a regional sales head and I don't know whether you know how aggressive Indian banks are like you see ICICI or Kotak or HDFC sure the sales is very very tired. very very aggressive and many people rightfully account for their success because of this approach that you are working on low margins you are working with people's money so only if you're able to sell more and more and more will the company be more and more and more successful. Sure. But this one recording of, of, of one of these managers having a go at his reportees went public and the guy was fired and so on. But I think it led to two very unique conversations, like polarized points of view, which is HDFC is probably one of the most successful businesses in India and is a, is a jewel for Indian banking and so on. Um, and the reason HDFC is as relevant as it is because as big as it is and it's as big as it is because there are people like him who are making sure that the company is on its toes all the time and the other point of view was around labor laws and treating people right and I, 
I don't know where you stand because given the Quest experience and given that you've worked with like a, like I think from McKinsey to Quest would have been very different kinds of people who you kind of surrounded yourself with at least uh, from from a skill set and life aspiration standpoint but what what's your view on that? No, look, I think that I think it's a you know it's it's very easy for me now that I'm not sort of in the corporate world to say oh <laughs> you guys are bad people but actually the, I think it's it is a complicated very issue right very. Um, uh, in that on the one hand you'd say well should labor laws not just be stricter yeah right but the fact is if you're a company working all over India today like with an all India presence there's 8,000 laws you already have to be on the right side of if you don't want to be non compliant we have enough laws correct um and so you can drive up minimum wage, that's possible. Right. I mean, and maybe we should be, but by the way, they've been going up. Minimum wage have been going up by 5% every year, more or less, last few years. So in Bangalore today, if you want to hire a security guard legally, which obviously most corporates do, yeah. a, a security guard costs as much as an entry-level IT engineer. Yeah, that is the reality of, of the cost, right? Um, so I think then the question is, because labor is becoming more costly, mm. uh, are we pushing them too hard to kind of work too many hours because we want to make sure we get value out of that? Uh, I think the conversation, I mean, I there I wish we would shift faster towards a productivity conversation yeah. rather than an hours conversation. Correct. I completely agree. Um, and, and my experience there has been that productivity, driving productivity is actually no longer about the technology because the technology is commodity. Anybody can get good software for uh, good technology to drive Salesforce productivity or to drive um, back office productivity. Huh. It really becomes about training that middle manager. The middle manager today is the biggest bottleneck towards better lives for people lower down. The control manager has not grown up using metrics. The middle manager has not grown up uh, in a way where they're trained to have a good conversation. I don't think we spend enough time training our middle manager. I really think so. I think if we can change that, really invest in our middle managers, help them understand this is how a dashboard works. Uh, this is how you use a dashboard. And, you know, honestly, this is how you read numbers on a dashboard and understand what actions to take based on the dashboard. And it's something that I think the telcos got right a long time ago. Correct. Uh, because they had pressure. Right? They were very, very competitive. And they had to train those middle managers. But I think in many other industries... Uh, what still works is I'm going to stand there and yell at the person until they deliver. And that's not the most productive way to do it. And part of the reason I, I, I joined Quest, so I'm one of these rare Indian men who likes to do things domestically. Right? <laughs> so I love to cook, I love to vacuum the house, I love to garden, I don't have a mali. Mm. But I remember when I came back, I remember the last time I called you, you were cooking. That's right. I'm, I like a cook on the, yeah, I love to cook. Um, I remember coming back to India and seeing a gardener who was mowing the lawn with a with hedge clippers. Right, he was on his knees and mowing a lawn with hedge clippers. And I was thinking, like, why doesn't the guy get a lawn mower? He could do in one hour what takes him a day and a half to do today. Correct. But for some reason, the middle managers don't see that, or don't want to see that, and therefore they don't push. So I think that mindset of labor is actually no longer cheap. Labor is expensive. It's a good thing. Let's actually increase their salaries, make them more productive. Everyone's happy. I think still we still got some ways to go on that. But do you think that will reduce the number of jobs or reduce employment in a dangerous way? So look, I think that um, all the science has shown that in that driving productivity actually raises capability. And therefore, yes, some people are displaced. By the way, that in a country like India, it may mean creating fewer jobs, not not reducing the number of jobs. It just means that as you grow as a company, maybe you don't add as many. Yeah. Uh, but it means increasing capability and more and more capable people then go on to start businesses, do different things. It just it really means investing in in human resource, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what we have to do as a country. The, the our biggest advantage today is we're one of the few countries in the world where population is, is still growing. In fact, our demographics is so different from the rest of the world. Right? Yeah. Even even median age, for example, we are we are in a, which is what like something which which is worrying is that if we don't get this right, we'll probably be wasting the most golden opportunity where, you know, where we have 
a confluence of everything that could go right. We have broadly stable borders. We have a functional government. Not forget the political party, but a yeah. functional government. We have an aspirational middle demographic in terms of age, um, and a global and a global acceptance of of being a country which is easy to hire from, do business in, etc. And if you are not able to create the right employment opportunities and the right price point, for lack yeah. of a better word, we will probably if we if we don't get it right over the next ten fifteen years, then that step jump that the country could see would be may not may not happen. Yeah, look, I mean, I suspect that unless we come in our own way, I think a six percent growth is of GDP and GDP. One can argue is a is an is a moronic measure, but you know, six percent growth is doable. Correct. I think for us, the real question is how do we get to eight to ten percent? Okay. If you look at some of the maths, which talks about our, uh, I, I've seen some maths around just the our population pyramid, how it's going to grow, how it's going to age. If we if we want to get to like middle income country status by let's say twenty forty twenty forty five, we need eight to ten percent growth. Okay, and that we're not hitting, and I feel that is something which will. And we were talking about this earlier. I think, I think that is you know that is not going to be about the hardware. In a sense, we've done a great job on creating hardware, right? We've got much better roads, ports. Um, we've got like digital infrastructure on finance. Our internet works well. Yeah. A lot of the infrastructures they can always get better. Yeah. The infrastructure is not an issue. I agree with you. Right? It it can always get better, and it will. I mean, the, I think we've been caggering for the last twenty, thirty years. We've been caggering our, you know, the we've been compounding the growth of infrastructure. So now it's at a point where I think it'll carry on. The issue is the software. In my mind, we're not working enough on the software. Say more. And by software, I mean, you know, if you drive on the German autobahn, mm. you can do one sixty, one seventy, one eighty, and there's no. There's no speed limits there, right? Uh, you can do 170 kilometers per hour easily. Yeah. But the reason you can do 170 kilometers per hour is you're pretty sure there's no car that's parked in the middle of the road looking at the forests, <laughs> right? Uh, or there is nobody, or like no one's going to suddenly change lanes. They will put the indicator on, they'll make sure you're not coming and then change. Uh, there's a ex- wonderful new Bangalore Mysore Expressway. Yeah. It, I think it's a it's beautiful infrastructure. It's great hardware. But I have, you know, as you drive on that road, it's not infrequent to see a truck in each or each of the three lanes, yeah. right? Uh, each overtaking the other at their own pace or not overtaking, just sticking to their lanes. Uh, un- one of the unfortunate outcomes of building an expressway is you bypass a lot of the old businesses. So, yeah. so this is one place where in near called Biradi, which is famous for a particular kind of idli, tatte idli. Huh. I love that. Um, Tate idli is awesome. Yeah. And everyone should have more of it. Um, um, but, you know, now if you're on the expressway, you can't eat Tate idli because it's fenced on both sides. Yeah. But there's some people who solve the problem by basically cutting holes in the fence. <laughs> and they go and get it. Yeah, so you get cars parked there, people jumping over to get their Tate idli. And you're like, you know, and then there's people who come from this lane to go and park there, <laughs> that lane. And so, I, you know, and that's what I mean by by software, right? How do we, can can we spend more time Talking about the software, you know, the British left in forty-seven. Now we've got our laws. These are our laws. Yeah. So civil disobedience is a bit out of place. Yeah. Right? Seventy-five years after independence, these are our laws. If we either we change them or we learn to abide by them, uh, I think it's the same for urban planning. I think that we don't follow our own laws. The other thing that I really, so that's so that, that's one bucket. I think another bucket that really gets my goat when I was driving around Gurgaon today is garbage. Yeah, right. And I think garbage on the streets and Swachh Bharat hit the nail on the head in terms of idea. Yeah, which is, you know, it's a mindset to say I will take pride. I'll take pride in what I do. I'll take pride in my country. I'll take pride in my city, and that means I will not drop litter. But we just, we haven't fixed our garbage collection. As I drive into, I've been going uh, for the for the uh, reforestation work that we're exploring. I've been driving quite often into rural Karnataka. And it's now a rural issue because people there are consuming stuff and they're being throwing out plastic and it's being picked up by somebody who's dumping it in heaps somewhere and it's just not controlled. And I right. think that that's something we need to wrap our head around. I think education. Sorry, go ahead. Let's see. So on sanitation, so I, my parents come from a city called Indore. Of course, I've been there. It's beautiful what they've done. So this is a 10-year journey. I think from 2014, Swaj Bharat, I think 
powers that be in Indore took it, and I have been to Indore from. from I, I remember Indore since '97, '98, since I was uh, in primary school, uh, because grandma was there, family was there, etc. It was absolute mayhem because one is it was indiscipline, and two it was a food loving city. So and it was fast food. It is fast food paradise. Yeah. So if you go to Sarafa or if you go to Chappan Dukan, it's not me. Yeah. And for vegetarians, insane, right? But there are if you go, Sarafa would be open till like three or four in the morning. If you ever go there early in the morning, it look it look filthy every single day. And right, it all of that would get collected, go into heaps, burnt, and all of that. So Indore had a serious pollution issue. Indore had a serious sanitation issue. Indore had a serious serious fecal sludge management issue. Etc. But 2014 onwards, um, the powers that be decided that it was a izzat ka sawal that Indore should be number one, and they took it as a goal. Now, how that true north star became the true north star, no one knows. But they just said it should be, and they did a lot of mindset changing things. So every morning when so they first launched an anthem, which I thought was the most bizarre thing in the world. Mm. So with the tempo that connects garbage from every community and every house plays music, plays that anthem loudly, and it was composed in a way that was most catchy for the middle class, the middle aged woman in those households. So after the tempo is gone, she's humming the tune for a few hours in the household. So it became like a thing. They did a lot of ads, the usual stuff, right? Fast forward to 2017 or 2018, I remember my dad ran the half marathon or the 10 kilometer run in the indoor marathon. You will not believe that city did not need, like did not need even, so there is a number of sanitation workers per runner or per 100 runners kind of a ratio. They were one tenth what is there for Bombay because they just did not need anyone to clean up after the marathon. Because the ethic is there. Because now kid, like the, the, the citizens, were picking up some some someone else bought it, pure by mistake. Dal diya ya fir gir gaya. For you, the person behind was picking it up. So the city was clean after the marathon. That's amazing, and it is a mindset shift. That's amazing. No, I was there. I I looked at their uh, uh, at their garbage disposal system last year, right? And at least my impression is so. First of all, you go to Sarafa now. I yeah. I went to Sarafa to eat. Ha. Huh. I mean, Sarafa is just spotless. Yeah. What's your favorite thing in there? The aloo tikki. Yeah. <laughs> it's damn good, no? But everything, man. The sabudana khichdi, the poha, the dahi balla. Have... They had stuff that I've never tried anywhere else also. What? I'm trying to remember. It'll come back to me. But they don't give you tissues, right? They that... You've got to go wash your hands with water. There's a small thing. <laughs> but it's it's so ingrained and I get the impression that as a city, it's, it's gained an economic dynamism because now people want to come there. People want to live there. Yeah. There's a bunch of sustainability companies that have been founded there. Correct. Um... So I, I just feel that that software around, let's take pride. And, and you know, my taxi driver said, he said, Sir, if someone will drop something, he will not be here. He will be here. He will be here. Yeah. Right? It's just so ingrained in this whole process. So I just feel that pride. Right? It's something that, so that software. And the third thing I feel is, you know, you spoke about, about um, uh, people, uh, education, right? We have 12 million people every year can do the to work most. Yeah. I feel jobless, I'm getting the impression, and I, it's difficult to get the numbers on this, but jobless growth is a reality around the world. Yeah? Right? Yeah, I think the US economy is doing fine, but still unemployment is high. Um, I think jobless growth is is a real thing because of automation, because of AI. By the way, we are worried that automation AI would take away blue-collar jobs. I think it's also taking away white-collar jobs now, right? I mean, creativity, uh, copywriting, all those things are going to start getting eaten into. Um, by how big a problem do you think that is? I don't know. See, I think, I think time will tell. So, if you go back historically, right, um, fifty percent of the jobs that exist today did not exist in nineteen forty. Correct. Right. So, one of my favorite examples, and there's a lady called uh, Mary Smith, huh. who was a human alarm clock, oh. and that is a real job in the UK until the nineteen seventies. <laughs> These people who go on pea shooters yeah. and basically shoot the windows with peas <laughs> to wake people up, right? They go, she got paid some seven pence a week or something. <laughs> oh, and her job no longer exists. Correct. Uh, but I'm sure that you know people have found jobs. So there's one theory which says um, people get displaced, but new jobs get created. As long as you can upskill people, you should be fine. 
right? Also remember that we are, as a civilized, as a humanity, this also surprised me. It spoke about trends, right? Mm. One trend that really surprised me is we seem to be maybe 40 years away from population peak, from peak population. Maybe even earlier. Every time they do the projection, every five years they project when will the world's population peak and every five years it seems to be peaking earlier. Oh, really? Yeah. So it used to be projected for the ninth, for the for the 2080s. Now they're saying it's maybe 2040, 2050. Right? That's not that far away. Yeah. Um, and so if you're, if you're living in a developed country today, you will soon start seeing population declining, or at least as people age, consumption falling, um, which means that GDP is, a, is an even nuttier definition of yeah. prosperity. But it also means that, you know, we might be living in a very different, so people who are young today, and we'll talk about longevity, I'd love to talk about longevity, right? Um, if you're 20 today, like I tell my son, he's going to live till he's 100. That most likely, unless a bus hits in, God forbid, but you know, he'd probably live till 100. Uh, and this is not going to be doddering after 60, right? Yeah. Because you'll have aging reversal, you'll have stem cell therapies, all these therapies that keep you active till you're 90, right? So you join your workforce at 22, 23. 70 year career. 70 year career. You're gonna, these kids are going to have a 70 year career. That's crazy. And the implication is not just on sort of what do I want to do with my life, the implication is also financial, right? Can you imagine? So I was thinking, I was thinking, how, thinking, how, do, how does one make this real, right? It's like saying my grandfather retired in 1980 and is still active today. None of your viewers were probably even alive in 1980, right? Yeah. 1980, the PC wasn't invented. Cars didn't have air conditioning. Right? The refrigeration was not household. No, and in it, those days, if you had a lack... It's huge. Yeah, I don't even know if Colour TV was there, by the way. When was the, the first cricket match that was broadcast in 84? I don't know. I think 84. So, so you know, it's like saying, okay, I retired in 84. I'm still active today. I'm still active. I had a lack in my pocket then. Which was a lot of money. Was a lot of money. How am, I, how am I looking after myself? But this notion of what is enough money to retire, this notion of retirement, this notion of one career, can you imagine founding the Bombay Shaving Company running for 70 years? <laughs> no, right? I mean, so I think we have to think of ourselves as, as almost like each of us is a conglomerate. Yeah. We're creating maybe some activities which generate cash, some which are sinking cash right now. We've got a portfolio of activities that are somehow self-sustaining and that portfolio mix changes over time as our interests and our purposes change. But it's always a portfolio we're adding. Maybe not till your 40s. Yeah. Right? Maybe you need to get a job first. Yeah. But I think at some point you have to switch um, and think of yourself differently and say, look, I'm not doing this for the next five years. I'm not doing it for the next 10 years. I'm doing this. So I'm now 47. I'm thinking I'm doing this for the next 50 years. Right? But what does that mean? What does that mean to kind of pick up a set of activities? I remember, I don't know what WhatsApp group it was on. Again, it's something that you said which stayed with me a lot. Um, which is, I think you were introducing, I think when we, maybe the McKinsey alumni group, what you said, I think you were introducing yourself somewhere on WhatsApp. And he said, hi, I'm Suraj, uh, Suraj, etc. Still figuring out what I want to do, do when I grow up. <laughs> I mean, that's a very, I thought it was a very cheeky, cool uh, way to put But now it makes a lot more sense because now, even at 47, you still have a 50-year career or a 40-year career. I don't it's, just, it's just freaky because there is just so much intelligence we have now on keeping ourselves healthy. From nutrition to exercise to, of course, pharmaceuticals and medical knowledge about anti-aging and reversing and so on. But even if you just keep yourself healthy through, like if Manan, for example, just exercise every day and eats well for the majority of his life, he has his... his, his so important, right? in the context, actually in the context of a 100-year life, if you start becoming unhealthy at 45, but I, as you know, I had a major illness Sick. in my early 40s, which was a bit of a wake-up call. Thankfully, it's Thankfully, it was a fixable one and I'm fine now and all of that. Good. But if you start becoming high cholesterol, obese in your 40s, you've got to live with that for 50 years. Yeah. And you've got to live with the problems. And, you know, one of my, my, my uncles, many, many years ago when I was young, he said the body is like a mango. <laughs> I said, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> I said, when a mango is green, uh, you can bang it here and there. Uh, you don't notice anything. 
But when the mango ripens, the same spots you banged it are the ones that become black. Wow. So, you know, so I think thinking about how do you sustain health and how do you look after your body and respect your body uh, is so much more important if you're living a longer life because you're going to live with that blackness in the mango for forever, much longer. Yeah. That is all. But coming back to the question around, 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 so there, there are two, three things that you're saying, right? One is we're going to live longer. Our careers are going to be shaped differently. What we do is not going to be what we used to do before. So now, for example, it won't be science, arts, commerce, or marketing, finance, consumer, consulting, banking, entrepreneur. It won't be any of that. It might be a totally different uh, dynamic. Uh, you're saying the world is changing in a way where globalization is kind of reversing. So maybe going outside may not be as lucrative. Even now, like going simply more risky. It's risky, yeah, right? Um, Financially, all the rules that you knew about retirement, like for example, today, if someone told me that, you know, here's 50 crore rupees, I, you, you can't earn a living, I won't be perturbed. But that's because I'm assuming I'm going to die at 65 and earn a living till then. But what if that's not the case? You're assuming that there's not going to be a period of hyperinflation? Yeah. Like the world went through many periods of hyperinflation where inflation was 10, 15%. Yeah. Imagine people who would work their asses off in Venezuela. Or Zimbabwe. For example. I it just because I don't know anyone from Venezuela, it doesn't seem real to me. But sometimes I just think to myself, fuck, what if this happens to the rupee, man? So I used to live in South Africa. Our uh, a lot of our staff was Zimbabwean, right? That's crazy. Mm. I have seen a ten billion Zimbabwean dollar though. But I have it somewhere, it's buried in some books or in my house. Uh I mean the fact is things get so bad that if you have money, if you have extra money, either you try and buy dollars. Because you believe in the dollar, by that's the other question mark, right? Do you still believe in the dollar? Do you, do you? I think I do, actually. I think I do, because I, look, I mean, I've, I have... Uh, it's a tricky place to be, by the way. It is a very tricky place to be. Because they have to service their debt. Yeah. They've given out bonds at 5%. Yes. It's a, it's a very, very tricky, like that currency is very tricky, right? It is very true, but I think the flip side, it, it's true. And I also think it's true that the US has misused its global dominance in many ways. Uh, the the U.S. has been a bully. There are many things the U.S. has done uh, in many parts of the world that I think are just atrocious. Blatantly, by the way. Blatantly. Blatantly atrocious. But I also think it's true that in the history of the world, they are the most benign superpower that has ever existed, right? I mean, if you look at India today, and you ask a lot of the kids leaving the country, where would you like to go? They would say, the U.S. Not Russia, not China, not Ukraine, right? The soft power there is immense. Right? Yeah. And the fact is that, yes, they have huge amounts of debt, but our IT services industry has grown on, frankly, on the, the back of that debt. Yeah, uh, A lot of our VC, you know, startups have grown to the back of that debt. Uh, in many places, they have intervened militarily, actually in a good way. Yeah, And that's also bankrolled by that debt. So in a sense, not all of that debt is bad for the world. No, of course. Right? I think the debt is great. Servicing of it is where the currency because the problem will come. Now, one can argue they can just print money, which is what they've been doing. At some point, so this very, very uh, interesting perspective by Ray Dalio, the founder yeah. of, of Bridgewater, and if you've read it. The Google, the Google guy, right? Uh, Bridgewater. So Ray Dalio was in Google before? No. Sorry, sorry I, I got you confused. Um, in fact, I just read it last week because a friend sent me the book where he says, look, you know, this is, this is how superpowers end. Superpowers end when they print too much money which all goes to the rich because the rich know how to capture it, uh, which drives further inequality, which then drives revolutions. And that's how that's how the Dutch hegemony ended. That's how the British hegemony ended. And here's how the American hegemony would end. And, you know, I think it's a real possibility. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not a possibility. I do think, though, that at the end of the day, if you ask most people in the world, um, would you rather have a world where the U.S. dominates or somebody else dominates? They'd probably pick the U.S., yeah. That's the first. So the question is then, can we move to a multipolar world? Uh, and will they make adjustments to allow for it? Like, Correct. you know, maybe there's a peaceful way that the United, that the Security Council actually becomes enlarged with players from Africa, people from Asia, uh, and more representative of the world's population. I think Turkey would like to have a seat on the table, right? Maybe that happens peacefully. But if it doesn't, then what's the alternative, right? Most people, I think, would say we'd rather just have America than have one more set of wars going on and sort of but you know some of these things can't be controlled no one planned for World War One. no one planned for World War Two. 
very interesting thing is I think while these years are cyclical, the cycles are also a lot longer. They're like kind of half century to century cycles. And uh, in the social setting, recently someone told me that before 2002, before Godra, India used to experience a major riot every three to four years. Every three to four years, there would be a major riot in India for different causes. Sometimes an assassination, sometimes communal, sometimes whatever, right? But from 1947, from partition till 2002, you would have a riot every four years. We haven't had a major riot from 20, 2002 for the last 21 years. So there is a movement, especially with the internet and democratization of information, even though it's polarizing because information is treated differently by different people, but because it is available, people, the, the possibilities of conflict have kind of gone down. So even with war, for example, public will hold governments and leaders responsible, even though there's the so it's a very contrarian yeah, set of I mean, It'll be interesting to see where it goes, Shafiq, because I think it cuts both ways. Uh, there's a very, very vocal minority on social media, uh, uh, which I think can be hijacked. And we've seen globally at many points, it has been hijacked. Correct. Uh, so the question is, does it, does the, are we democratizing uh, voices? Or are we creating skewed voices? I don't, I really don't know. Uh, but my, but, you know, I mean, for me, all this is not to say that I know where the world is going, but I know that I can feel in my bones that the world today is far riskier than the world I inherited from my father when I was 20. I think so maybe, so maybe, maybe my generation is screwed up at, in, in some sense, right? Uh, but I think it's far riskier. I think it's a far riskier. Well, you're right. That's, that's what I was saying, right? Because now you're saying geopolitically, we don't know. Jobs are uncertain. Um, uh, uh, from a financial security standpoint, we don't know currency. Like the playbooks that we were born with don't exist anymore. But I'll I'll give you the flip side of the story. Huh. Okay, let's let's assume that the world makes it through the next twenty twenty five years. Huh. Maybe we fight. Maybe we don't fight. We make it through. I think you fast forward to twenty fifty. Right, we are in a world where we transition to clean energy. We're not polluting the world anymore. Human population is in decline, so we have more space. I mean, not fighting for resources anymore. Um, uh, people are far wealthier because as human population declines, you can redistribute the wealth of the rich, and so inequality has come down. Possibly, we stop measuring ourselves on GDP because it no longer suits the West yeah. to measure <laughs> themselves on GDP. So they talk about a different index. Yeah, uh, and the world is, has has a slightly more holistic way of measuring ourselves. So I think 2050 onwards, the world is, it's looking very nice, right? And I'm, a, I'm an optimist, despite all of this, <laughs> I'm a huge optimist. I just think that the the risk is in the next 20 years to say, how do we, how do we negotiate this change? I, I am not that a huge optimist about the world. I just think that, you know, one has to be more thoughtful about navigating it now than maybe we had to when, you know, 20 years ago. No, for sure. And I experienced it a lot when, when I speak to younger kids at Bombay Shaving Company. Because... The crossroads of aspiration and reality are very stark for this generation. How do you mean? Okay, so let me give you a sense, right? Um, look at someone like me, I'm 36, right? My parents had some of their careers, maybe 30% of their careers before liberalization and then 60% after liberalization. So my father's salary took a while to get to a certain level. Like most people of, like most of my friends in school lived in two-bedroom apartments mm. within a family of four or five people with grandparents, parents, a sibling or two. They were people sleeping in the living room every night. Yes. Mm. And when cousins would come over, six cousins together, right? Um, but if you look at these kids who are now 23, 24, their parents are possibly your age, maybe a few years older. They... <laughs> no, the twenty three like yeah. mom will be twenty five. Their parents have their parents have lived for twenty five percent more time than my current age. You're living till the hundreds. How does that matter? No, but for them, the, there is a significant dif difference in the lifestyle their parents give them versus the lifestyle a middle class parent gave my generation. And I feel. Like, they want to become independent, become entrepreneurs, become this, become that. 
at 24. Their lifestyle is defined by a 25, 30, 35 lakh per year household. They make 8 lakh per year, 6 lakh per year, 10 lakh per year. And that drop in lifestyle is hard to absorb for this generation. I genuinely feel that. You know, Europe was there. I, I'm surprised it's happening that quickly because Europe was there. Maybe this is a very small sample. Maybe 10 years ago. Right? I mean, it took Europe that long to get there. I'm surprised. Maybe it's a small sample. Maybe I, I do think that for those in India who made it, yeah. to get to the next level uh, is a lot more tricky. Correct. If you're a professional and for your kids to then... If you're a professional, your kids are going to be... Are not going to inherit. They'll take time to get there. Yeah. And then they're not wealthy. Yeah. It's not It's not, It's not. It's not like 20 factories you had land coming to you, right? This is money, which is probably in... Which, by the way, is hard to liquidate even though it's completely liquid. It's not something that gives you... And a lot of it is in land, is in the house that your parents live in and they're living longer. Correct. It's not coming to you for... Exactly. Them. And like middle class India is not the kind who will pass on inheritance a lot. I think aristocratic India or promoter India or business business India is the kind it will pass on. Service driven wealth does not pass on as easily. So this generation is aspirational but reality hits them very hard. Plus there is a lot of soft stuff, right? Where we are becoming a lot more sensitive, yeah. call it woke, you know, which is good, which is good because you end like that. It's kind of good. That mindset protects the weakest, but it dumbs down the strongest, I feel. Yeah, I think you've done right. So so my view on this is, I think the ability to respect diversity, the ability for me, an individual, to respect diversity, sorry, to respect diversity, is absolutely central to me being a human being. So as a human being, in my development, society, my parents, I have to teach myself to respect people who are very different from me. Right. Is, is is that an effort? Yes, I think it is an effort because, and this is what I learned in South Africa and which has been reinforced ever since, which is that, especially the business world today, not today, 10 years ago, it was, an, it was a white, well, take, take out white, Anglo-Saxon male culture. Correct. Okay. Why do Indian males do well? Because frankly, we've been brought up in this British educational system. We're very comfortable in Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Right. Why do other Asians not do so well? Because they're still brought up in their own cultures. Yeah. They're not Anglo-Saxon. Now, the Anglo-Saxon male culture, first of all, obviously doesn't like LGBTQ+. Right? And that is a segment which has really struggled. Women have struggled in the workplace because there's a certain backslapping, pump drinking culture yeah. in the Anglo-Saxon male world. world. But it took me time to learn that for example, and I know this in Africa with black people, South Africa with black people, right? We're deeply uncomfortable in an Anglo-Saxon male culture because it means I have to look you in the eye and disagree with you if you're my boss. If I disagree, I've got to look you there and say, no, you're wrong. But in my culture, that's arrogance, right? My grandfather will slap me if I look him in the eye. How dare you look me in the eye? Yeah. So there's this dissonance that comes in and nobody has taught these individuals to say, well, and, and, and by the way, the flip side is you'll have the boss saying, this guy is not straight. He never looks me in the eye. Right? It's good. Jola. He never looks me in the eye. Why is that? Right? So you've got these traditional mannerisms. Or, you know, the other one I would get from a, from some of our young black associates was, we are appalled by your problem-solving session. Everybody's cutting off everybody all the time. In our culture, you wait till the person finishes speaking, you acknowledge that they made a point, and then you gently make a counterpoint. <laughs> right? This is not my culture. I can't work here. This is against my culture. Um, and so obviously then, so I, so I think the, 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 so it's very important because in South Africa, if you can't, if black people are not comfortable in your culture in Africa, they're 90% of the talent. You're missing out on 90% of the talent pool. Forget do good in the world. That's all great. But just from you, you want to make sure you get the best talent. Yeah. If 90% of the talent is not comfortable in your culture, Tip. you have a problem. Yeah. Then you've got 5% who are women. So that's 95%. Yeah. Then you've got the LGBTQ community, which is the 2%. Yeah. So actually you're tapping into what? 3% okay. of the population. Yeah. Right? So I think if you want to build a great institution, you have to learn to 
make everybody comfortable in your organization. That I truly believe. I truly believe in the importance of diversity. But I think wokeness takes it to, I mean, some of the things I hear take it to a very different level, right? Yeah. Which is, which I don't agree with. I, I, I don't think that one has to normalize everything in this world. Yeah. Right? I might not, I might not think that, I might think you're an outlier in the way you behave. Yeah. That doesn't mean that I can't fully embrace you as a professional. Correct. Uh, and, and, um, mm-hmm. And help you be successful and make my company successful yeah. in the process, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that is where I, sometimes I feel we've lost the plot. Yeah. But sorry, I, I, I interrupted you. You were saying something. No, no, I, no, I completely agree. I think, no, even not the wokeness part also. I think being woke is being, is being sensitive to the weaker link in the chain, right? Whether it's a minority or whether it's... A, and typically it's the job of the government to protect the weakest section of society, right? So... But government follows society. So society takes on the the burden. the burden of being woke or whatever the word is. But I think what it has evolved into, at least in the most extreme forms, is that in protecting the weakest, they're trying to say that meritocracy, mer- meritocracy is is either bad or uh, non like not useful. For us at all, in which case, for example, it's like a lot, a lot of my friends are young parents, right? Mm. Uh, or parents of young kids and are very confused with children going to school and not having examinations anymore. Or children going to school, coming last in a race and still being given give, given a prize for it. right? Because you don't want to hurt people's feelings, they don't want to protect the weakest link of the chain and so on. But at what point do they learn? Because then you don't want a generation of people who... At the year 23, 24, because in the real world, you will get slapped in the face at some point. You don't want to not be ready for it. And that's that's the other question, right? Around It's again a complex issue, isn't it? Because on the one hand, I think you're unnecessarily, you're almost insulting this child who came last by giving him a medal. Because you're kind of, what you're saying is, I don't believe you're capable yeah. of doing better. Yeah. So here, take a medal, you did your best. Correct. So I, 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 and the other school of thought is to remove the race entirely, which is which is I think very counterproductive. Which is also I think counterproductive because the world there, there is a race in the yes. world. You may opt out of it, Correct. but the race exists. It's important Correct. to know. See, I think there's also I feel this difference between equality and uh, equivalence. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, if you you know I have two kids, right? It's stupid of me to say I want to treat them equally, yeah. because they come with different strengths, um, different interests. And they need different help at different points in time. So not right now I'm in Delhi with, with my son because he needs all this time. Now, am I treating the other son equally? No, he might say I'm being unequal, you're in Delhi, you're not with me, right? Yeah. But I think there's this notion of equivalence in the workplace. So I, for example, will sometimes say this particular position, I will only hire a woman. Mm. And I'll have some people saying, but that's not fair. Uh, you're not giving men an equal chance. And I'm like, well, you know, equality, I think is, is a, you know, it's, it's a bit of an outdated notion in that sense, right? I need a, I need to increase, I want to increase the number of women on my team. This is a position where I know I can find a woman. Yeah. I will not take a male for this position. I'm going to get my talent acquisition to work even harder, right? Or there'll be times when I will, I will know that someone on the team with a little bit of extra coaching can go a lot further. Maybe they've not had that coaching in the past. Maybe the background is not there. Maybe they've got a, maybe they're underconfident. I will spend more time with them. They may be weaker. Is that lack of equality? No, I think that's about equivalence. How do you make sure you're treating, you're getting everyone to a good position? Because at the end, you want your team to be a strong team. And Correct. You do want to, you know, one of the things I loved about McKinsey was how much time he spent on people development. Yeah. Right? I think, at the end, what do we leave behind in the world? Right. I, there's this, the tyranny of the I. I think one of the things I realized, or I'm, difficult to realize, I'm increasingly becoming aware of, is that I is a, such a meaningless context, right? I am a senior partner at McKinsey, where you know, I've resigned and now I am no longer a senior partner yeah. at McKinsey, right? So where is the I in the McKinsey? It's not there, it's just McKinsey, right? Yeah. And so all you can really do is make people better and that's the lasting impression you leave in the world. I think beyond that, it's very tough. A friend once told me in the last 2,000 years, how many Indians have, 3,000 years, how many Indians have really left an impression? The Buddha, Ashoka the Great, like Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, maybe you could add him to the list. Too early to sit mm. because he's only 150 years old, right? But how many Indians can you actually count who made a difference? So we live our lives every day thinking, I am important, I am this, I am that. 
But where is this? What is the significance of the I in all of this? Aryabhatta. Aryabhatta. He did. Mm. Yeah. But you are right. You are absolutely right. I want to come back to your, you know, your, you, we, we spoke about a very different, complex, difficult to navigate world because of so many variables that are difficult to predict given that they will not follow cycles of the past. And then you painted a more optimistic picture around clean energy, um, declining population, and a world that is measured on things beyond growth. And I agree with you. I think greed only gets you this far. After that, it has to be like you have to go. Like I think the world will have to go from being a teenager to being an adult, right? But and we we spoke about Japan earlier, uh, where we say you know. They're kind of in that declining population, measure happiness a lot more and so on. But do you think they're really happy? Because like a lot of studies show social connections are much lower. Um, intimate relationships are a lot lower. Uh, because of only zero child or single child households, family. And someone told me this the other day. Today, everyone had only one child. Their kids would never know the concept of cha-cha, chachi, bua, mama, yeah. ma, right. masi. That concept that's, will not the chan- oh, problem, right? with a single child. And that's probably what is happening with Japan with the declining population as well, like with only one or zero children. So 2050, what if we have all this clean energy and financial independence and so on? And let's say the migration of India to middle class or even above has happened uh, and have created the jobs and so on. But do you think we'll be happy given that we may not have the social networks that have kept us happy for so long. And I think our happiness is rooted in, in being familiar. Yeah, you know, it's a, I, I, I've never thought about this. Okay. I've never thought about it. I think it's a great question. Um, I feel that, so one of the things that's going to happen to India in the next 50 years is our urban population is going to double. Right? We're 30% now, we're going to go to 60%. And I feel that society... It's one of the reasons I moved back to India. Uh, and maybe this is where my thinking comes from was, you know, I did an expat for 15 years, five years in Belgium, six years in South Africa. Where did you leave India? You left as an EM. As an EM, yeah, okay. 2004. Okay. Uh, went to Belgium, uh, was elected partner there, then went to South Africa for six years, director there, then Philippines for a few years to lead that practice, came back to India. Part of the reason I came back was I just felt like I don't have roots and a place where I belong. Like, I just lost it. I, I, like, you know, I think we only met after I came back. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, one example is the entire group of Mc, McKinsey India people in the interim. I just didn't know. I'm getting to know them now as I come back to it. I just didn't know, right? Uh, my friends from college, I just didn't bother meeting because I would come once a year for two weeks, spend time with my immediate family and leave. So I just felt like I don't have, I don't feel rooted. And I think part of the issue with urbanization is that your social network changes completely right? because you still think Acha, I'm from that village near Sholapur yeah. but actually you no longer are and your kids for sure are not because they have an urban identity immediately right? and yet our our cities are models of disconnection say more? well I think that possibly because we don't have democracy at a city level it's almost like we we come into our cities, we use them as we need to, and then we leave. Right. Um, so one of my bugbears is when we and and by the when I was young, I did the same thing. I moved to Mumbai, spent four years there, didn't learn Marathi, spent six years in Gujarat, didn't learn Gujarati. I was like, "Wait, Hindi one right? But I feel like you know, if I now I feel like if I move to a city, I should like at least learn the basics of the language. Yeah. Um, I should try and contribute to some society there, either be part of my residence association, maybe go and plant trees, do something that sort of contributes to the city and to the day yourself there. Uh, whereas I feel like all a lot of us feel like tourists now, yeah. or temporary passengers in the cities we live in, right? And so the sense of community, uh, I feel, is not as well developed in our cities, and that's something that we need to work on. And I wonder if, if actually strengthening urban democracy will help. That's a good point. Because, yeah, we don't elect our leaders, no? We don't elect our leaders. Uh, we don't, 
we don't have community action, yeah. uh, right? Tree planting camps, and you know, in summer that our kids all sell lemonade in one place and we don't go and buy it. Yeah, we don't do that stuff actually. We used to. We used to when cities were smaller, and when people stayed in communities that were either around, you know, for example, PSU has had okay, this is the townships, townships that you lived in, and so you all kind of had connections beyond living there because you were connected at work or whatever. Yeah. Right? But how many of our kids go to the same school? I, I, I remember I have friends from Bilai who all knew each other and they always met on Diwali and every other Saturday. I remember in Pune also, like we had a, I used to live in a, in a lane called Park Avenue, incidentally. <laughs> but it was in a place called Lound. But all the kids knew each other. We would go to three, four schools, similar tuitions, every evening cricket and football together. Uh, parents would know each other. And I think, and maybe I'm, I might get this wrong, but I think there was stability driven by lack of ambition. To you know, people then didn't dream of going out, and that's what kept the community, yeah, and the community. And your relationships mattered because you were right. there for ten years, fifteen years. Sorry, you grow old. So ambition comes in the way of community building, in my view. Can, or you have to make a lot of effort. To be ambitious, move around, and still be rooted. Because otherwise, yet somehow in the U.S. they do it. Actually, I think the U.S. is one of the countries which has the best community level bond shift, right? And maybe because a lot of the community is built around the local school, and people Correct. go to a local school, and therefore, you know, public schools are still yeah. You're right. Maybe it's that, but I. But, but you're right. I think in our case, and Bombay, in my mind, is a great, a wonderful city. Love it to bits. Love uh, living there. When were you there, Bombay? Uh, 1990, 2004. Your first few years at McKinsey. First few years at McKinsey. But, you know, a lot of the people I know who lived in Bombay for 20 years, 25, 30 years, I mean, the day you retire, you leave. Right? It's too expensive to stay there and so you kind of always have a home somewhere that you move to. Very few people actually want to live in McKin in uh, Bombay after retirement. Yeah. And so your attitude towards Bombay is very functional. Yeah. Transactional almost. Very transactional. You love the city but you're transactional. Were you same Ahmedabad by as Kuldeep? Yes. And Saiki? And Saiki. Ah, yes. Is. And Sudhir Sitapati as well. Sudhir was also a bad. That's a very, very cool batch of people. Yeah, it was a very intimidating batch to be a part of. How many kids were you? How many How many were you? At McKinsey? No, no, at, at, at Ahmedabad. By me, 200. Now I think the batch is about 500. Oh, really? Those days it was 200. I was just thinking, 99 to 2000, you're probably that, that vintage. And Toshan was a few years afterwards. Toshan was a few years afterwards. Um, interesting. I do want to come and talk about, um, uh, I think when you helped me a lot with my back issue last year, uh, that is when I really learned. He didn't help you. Mutu helped. Mutu helped me. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I didn't pay him for a while. I told him to put, to put it on your tab. <laughs> and he took it seriously also. He was like, yeah, sure, should, should I do that? I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm, I thought you were Suraj's friend. Eh? Like, we learned from the alcohol too. <laughs> yeah, no, he was like, no, but I, I think that was when, um, you know, talking to you helped a lot. And that's when I also understood a lot more in detail about about the health um, uh, situation that you went through and how it helped to build perspective. But would love to kind of go deeper on that. Just, you know, flying career at McKinsey, global citizen, expat, senior partner, living the life, right? Um, what happened? So look, I mean, I, I think I think at some level it's about the agony of hitting 40, mm -hmm. right? I think I, I hit the 20-year mark at McKinsey. Um, so first of all, I think if you, if, you, if you step back a little bit, right, I think that I've always been a very, I've always prided myself on being a congruent human being. So what do you mean by congruent? Congruent is sort of, you know, I... Uh, I'm very clear about what I value. My What I value drives my purpose and my purpose drives my actions. And there's very little disconnect between. And I struggle, I actually struggle with shades of gray in between. Right? Um, and I think what happened through, what happens to all of us through life, I think, and it's easy, like, easy in hindsight to watch it, is what I valued changed. Whether I think our values also change as we grow older, right? I think I become far more liberal now uh, then I was growing up in a middle class, upper caste environment. 
Uh, so our values change, but I think what we value changes as well. Um, so I already spoke about why I went to IMA. What I value is economic stability. Correct. Uh, and then coming out of IMA, you have a choice of investment bank or consulting. Okay. Um, and then 99 was a good job market, right? 99 was, yeah, I think McKinsey had the largest batch. We hired six people out of IMA that it was larger than ever before. Um, that's probably why I got in. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but um, uh, I also come from a family which is sort of a family of priests. Uh, and these are people who've been sort of named and storied for like, depending on which uncle I talk to, 21 generations, 26 generations, like they've got the lineage back. back. So it's, this is all about, there's a family which prides itself on on sort of being counselors and priests and reputation and so on and so forth, right? Comes with positives and negatives. But um, there was a sense that my father always instilled in me. You are the eldest son of the elder son of the elder son going back as far as anyone can remember. You have an obligation to uphold the family name, right? So reputation and doing something that was respectable was really, really important to me. Yeah, and I think what really resonated with the McKinsey environment was McKinsey is all about reputation, yeah. right? It's all about sort of it's not it's it's about being better, not bigger. It's about yeah. impact, not money. It really resonated in yeah. the sense I could I could go to McKinsey and sort of be almost take my ancestral uh, occupation yeah. and translocate it into the business. <laughs> yeah, correct. So that really resonated. And I, I just, I think, um, I really wanted to do well there. Uh, and the first two years, I felt like a fish out of water. Then I figured out sort of how to adjust there. Then my wife went to Cambridge to study. That's why we left the country. Um, and then at some point, I was like, oh my God, I could, like, partner is partnership is touching distance I, I think I can make it and I never expected to and I was the, f I was the first Indian to be elected on the, on the European continent at the time right it never happened are you serious yeah. um, it never happened I think I was helped I mean it's also also the times right the world was changing I just happened to be in the right place at the right time but Hemant Alawad was much after you or uh, Hemant, Hemant moved to Belgium when I was there oh and he's, he's obviously a superstar, right? Who oh, is? I've never met him. I've never a superstar. I've just heard about him. Love him to bits. Um, um, but yeah, so sort of got to partner. And then I just had the most... I, I think I, I just, just a breakdown. I'm like, okay, now I made partner. Now what? Right? And you know the McKinsey system. Every six months feedback. And yeah. this is what they tell you what you have to do to get there. And suddenly you make partner. And they're like, okay, welcome. <laughs> And they're like, okay, but now what should I do? Tell me which hoop to like jump through. And like, there's no one telling you anything. Uh, and, um, and I remember going to a very senior partner at the time and asking, you know, can you tell me what a partner does? Like, what's my job? I, I, I don't know what a partner does. And he said, you know, just imagine that you are, a, you are the sixth partner in a firm of five partners. Do what you think those five partners are watching don't worry about how you're evaluated. Don't worry about anything. Just do what those five partners would want you to. It's like, okay. Oh, That's interesting. Right. Relatively sort of global. Yeah. But okay, I can I can work with that. Yeah. Um, this is what year? 2007, 6, 7, 7, 8, 7, 7. 2007. And around that time, I started realizing I was born in Africa. I was born in Tanzania, but grew up until I was 12 in Zach in Zambia. Oh, really? I had no idea. I was still a teacher there. So I came back to India for my eighth standard, actually. I would still keep going back and forth by my parents with it. Uh, and so I had this real draw to Africa. Uh, and the African practice was looking for someone to build a telecoms practice. There. But when I moved to Belgium, I was told it was a suicide. Now like, it's okay, it's fine. Because I didn't really see myself staying at McKinsey for long anyway. This time, I was also told it was suicide because, you know, who goes to Africa? It's just not relevant. Again, I got really lucky with Tiger because that's when Africa came into onto the global map. Um, partly because the economies were doing very, very well. Commodity prices were on a high. So I moved to South Africa. Uh, and my purpose became, I realized, okay, the way I interpreted my job as a partner was to make the firm better. I felt Africa was an important geography. I felt, so I led the telecoms practice. That was before mobile penetration was 100%. And I felt that was a good thing for the world to have more mobile phones. So I said, okay, I am going to 
my role is going to be helping McKinsey help African operators get to 100% penetration and to build a practice here. And that has made me really happy. It's an amazingly sharp problem statement, by the way. Thank you. Is it post facto or was, do you know, think no, about that? At that time, I just felt this is what this is what is going to be meaningful to me. When I literally served mobile, I'd never served mobile operators before. Wow. So I learned the system, served mobile operators for the next five years, and then had this crisis again before, and I had not made senior partner yet, but they called it director in those days. Uh -huh. I was like, this feels meaningless. It feels meaningless because I'm just giving advice to people. Who was I'll saying, do it myself. People, I don't feel it's going anywhere. At that point, another... another a senior partner who I dearly love, he said, listen, shut up. You're going to make director. At that point, your degrees of freedom will be much larger. Um, make director and quit then, but not before that. So I shut up. Uh, I was lucky. kind of got elected. And then I said, okay, I'm moving. Uh, and I said, now if I'm going to stay in the firm, I want to be part of actually shaping a country, McKinsey in a country. I want to build the office uh, lead the building of an office um, that is the model McKinsey office. People values, client values, great activity, all of that. And the firm will be looking for someone to build the Philippines uh, practice uh, to, to accelerate that. So I moved to the Philippines and we love Manila. Yeah, we absolutely loved it for the first three years. It was absolutely fine. And then my and then I ran into my health issue. Um, was it just a lot of travel? What, what, what happened there? I, so in hindsight, I think it was a combination of a lot of travel combined with just a lack of purpose. So the, 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 the travel, I think, you know, in Southeast Asia, if you're vegetarian and you're traveling, you eat pasta most of the time. If the diet is bad uh, and two red-eye flights a week. So I think the, the lifestyle is eating health. But I also think at some point, and this is what I started realizing that I almost drew more pleasure out of figuring out how to use the conference rooms in the office optimally than I did out of advising clients. So I was like, I, I think I like doing stuff. And I think I'm just frustrated with having to tell people what I think they should do. Yeah. And then I hit the 20-year mark and, you know, I was 42. It was very clear that, I, you know, I, you're, you're in a place where you could spend the rest of your career at the firm and I have to make adjustments. Uh, and figure out what I would do at the firm, find my inspiration, but I could do that. You know, I, I have this 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 thesis that the heart and the head decide differently, right? And they're often in sync, but there's this, there's sometimes, at least in my case, I found frequently this lack of synchronicity between the heart and the head. So sometimes the heart decides and the head is like, oh, it doesn't make sense, right? And that's either you're being emotional or, you know, you need to just listen to your gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Sometimes the head decides and the heart goes, uh-uh, this is not good. Um, and I think with the decision to leave McKinsey, sometimes my heart was saying yes and the head was saying no, or the head was saying yes and the heart was saying no. I think the illness was a trigger to say, you know what, there's a huge unknown out there. With it, a lot of my friends were McKinsey. McKinsey was all I knew, right? The only company I'd worked at. McKinsey made me who I am today. Yeah. In, in every way. Um... But I said, no, it's just, I think at that, I think the illness got the two in sync and I just sent my resignation before I could sort of like, uh, not resignation, but I kind of let everyone know I was leaving before I could change my mind. And then started looking out. And I think at, around that time, I read this book by Anand Giridadas, Winners Take All. I don't know if you read the book. He was a firm alum, no? He is a firm alum. His, both his dad and his uncle were senior partners in the firm. Um... And in that book, he's taken on a very, very provocative view on also what McKinsey and the Goldman's of the world do. But basically, his thesis was, listen, rich people are making more money, poor people aren't getting paid more. By the way, philanthropy is all about guilt money going back. So if you really want to make a difference, go be an agent, go work in the firm. Be an agent, sorry, own, be a, be a prime mover of capital, don't be an agent of capital, was sort of his thesis. And I had been excited so I was very clear I was going to go work in an industry where the product itself, I felt, was good for, was moving society through. Right. So I shortlisted healthcare, education, and actually blue-collar worker because of my observation with that guy with the HMD. Yeah. I was like, God, there's, like, Indian labor is the most unproductive I have seen. There's room to make money here. Right? Train them better, 
give them more money, but you'll make more money out of them. And there's a business to be done. And that's when Ajit, coincidentally, out of the blue, called me and said, let's talk, right? He heard about me through somebody else. And we, uh, and that was great, that transition to, I loved it. I spent a little over two years there. I think I confirmed my suspicion that I like to do things. <laughs> um, and they were, you know, I took over a week into the first lockdown as CEO. That's crazy. And I was like a C, I was like a COVID baby. Uh, and what are the transition like from being an advisor for 20 years to being a CEO of how many employees did Quest have at that, that time? A little under 400,000. Now they're up to 500,000. Four lakh people reporting into you directly or indirectly. Yeah, but that's sort of a bit dramatic, right? I know. Ten people reporting <laughs> indirectly. Uh, and they manage people who then manage people who manage a 400,000. But still, like, you feel responsible. You feel responsible. And you feel amazing that every night a million people get dinner, go to bed with dinner because, because of salaries that have been paid by the company, right? So you feel the job, I felt the job was meaningful. And was it as hands-on as you would have expected or loved? So, yeah, yeah. It was all the way from, I, mean, I think in two years, we did a, st a reshaping of the portfolio. We doubled cash flows. I realized I love reviewing accounts. Accounts receivable. It's just amazing fun. <laughs> um, it is It is really amazing. And I think also the fact that I think working in a corporate and a line role, you just have many more people you work with yeah. than as a consultant. Right? And it goes from, let's say, working with 10, 15 people to working with closely with, let's say, 100 people. Yeah. And much more high stakes, I feel. Yeah, or no? Yes and no. Now, the wonderful thing about running a company is that um, you make 10 decisions a day, right? Two go wrong. Yeah. It's okay. Right? The eight that went right will keep things moving. And there's, and there's a certain amount of, it's a flywheel, right? And the flywheel is running high. Like there are days you can say today, I just don't feel like doing much. It's okay. And the company will still run. Yeah. Being a consultant, if you don't turn up for that client review, you lose the client. Yeah. Uh, so every day, every... In fact, one of the things I've been beating out of myself for the last year is this notion of I have to use every minute of my day well. Uh, because as a consultant, that's really what's drilled into you. How do you use your time really, really, really well? Yeah. Whereas I realize that now I need a different mindset, which is how do I make sure I'm doing the right things? Correct. And sometimes things just take time. Sometimes things just take time. How was it to manage a public company, a public board? I loved it. So I got very lucky. I think Ajit Isaac, the founder of Quest, was a phenomenal teacher. Uh, he gave me a lot of space. He gave me the reins. At the same time, he was always there when I needed him. Right? Uh, we talked almost every day. Uh, and, you know, going from a very high margin services business to a very low margin services business with a lot of context, a lot of old timers. Um, and I was very grateful for him. He was a great teacher. The board was very, very supportive. Um, great team. Like, you know, I'm not one of those people who believes you come in and fire half the team. You actually worked with most of the people who were already there. You inherited the team and you kept them, which is yeah. very counter to a lot of too. Like large company CEOs don't do that usually because there are trust issues. There are a, a lot of those reportees would have been vying for the job, I'm assuming. So, oh, no, but look, I mean, I think that. I think that as, as professional managers, we are stewards of our companies for whoever comes next. Okay. Right? I think the worst thing you can do is go there and make it about you and then my team, my company, my shareholders. Uh, so when the time came to leave, I mean, the transition has been seamless because, uh, you know, I, I think it's, import it's important that you not kind of make it too much about, about you. It's not about you. Once you're gone, you're gone. Right? Quest continues. Right. But I love the public markets. Yeah, uh, I think the public markets are an amazing thing for the right for for. To keep you honest, and absolutely honest. Do they keep you honest? Yeah. So I think it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a of a tango. Yeah. Uh, I think the fact is you do have analysts who sometimes some analysts are sometimes a little bit too much about their Excel model, so you got to keep them honest. Yeah. But I think the wonderful thing about a public market is if they understand what you're trying to do. Uh, if they have a model which delivers a decent amount of value in a reasonable amount of time. If you're saying what you're doing and you're doing what you're saying, yeah. and you're explaining the variances in a in an open and trusting manner, I my experience was you get so much leeway with them. Yeah. I did, but but you know, I think then I think you need to respect the market. The moment you go public, it's not your company. Yeah. It's not your company. Right? That's all so, point. It's a public company. It's a public company and I think you have to you have to understand that and respect that. 
And yes, sometimes the public buys the stock because you are the entrepreneur and they believe in you, right? But that can very quickly chew. Um, I think there's very few entrepreneurs in the world who've kept public market uh, kind of who who who've, who the public market continues to hold as a sole representative yeah. company over a period of time. Very few have managed to do that. Agree. Um, because at some point they also want predictability and they want a lot of things which go against the grain of entrepreneurism. Right. So I always tell when startups come to me saying you want to IPO, I ask them, are you ready? Are you ready to create stability? Yeah. To create a three-year, four-year direction and to execute against it? Or are you going to pivot the next time someone comes and offers you a big check? Uh, in which case, you're not going to build trust with the markets and you're not going to get the valuation you want. No, I agree. Sahil Dalal at Advent, I don't know if you know him. He's like, what is this IPO board in your office and all that? Don't IPO. Just keep the company private. You know, reap the rewards. Keep your shareholders happy. It's too much pain. And then, of course, there is the whole romantic idea of an IPO, which is just beautiful, right? Because you want it's a it's a it's a watershed moment for your company to be owned by the Indian public. Um, uh, but I think running large scale public company also is a is a skill where you have to balance long term vision with quarterly performance, right? Which kind of shapes your price. Um, price shapes compensation plus dividends plus so much more so I think it's a I think it's a very exciting true but at the same time Shantanu 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 you could call me Shantanu I would say I would try to practice I've never heard that pronunciation Shantanu really? it's like Morje there's no where did you get from? S to you as fast as possible Shantanu Shantanu at the same time I think that the difficulty in going private from private to public is that the 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 time frame changes. And I think part of the the peculiarity of the private markets in the last three years has been employees want ESOPs vested monthly and sort of cashed out quarterly, right? Yeah. Uh, the reality of stock is it's meant to be held for three to five years. Yeah. Uh, and I think in a public market, sure, you had a bad quarter. Go and tell the market you had a bad quarter. Yeah. They understand everybody has bad quarters, right? Maybe this, you know what? Maybe right now your stock is in the toilet. Maybe it should be in the toilet right now. And that's okay. You just keep doing what you're doing with the right purpose. Yeah. Right? Uh, it'll fix itself. But the worst thing you can do in building a business is to constantly keep your eye on valuation. Because I think it's like cocaine. It just, I don't know, it, I've seen it mess with, so valuation just messes with people's heads uh, and makes them believe things about themselves that just aren't true. But your valuation is a result of hard work plus a lot of luck plus somebody else's view of what you're doing. Correct. Based on a very small aperture into who you are, right? Yeah. Right. I think multiples, revenue multiples is a very dangerous place to go down, right? Public market is fine because you're trading the business and you're trading it with a view of appreciation of stock plus dividend in, right? In private markets, it's not. There's no dividend. There's no. Or rarely there is. Uh, there is only an exit situation. Um, someone, I, I, I think it was Sam Altman, or I forget who, but someone said this that a ten times revenue multiple basically means that over the next ten years, I'm going to give you hundred percent of my revenues every single year. Okay. And I'm not even in inflation, not in just a situation. And then we break even. That makes no sense. How can a company even do that? So that's the bar of valuation, which are sometimes a lot of people put on invest on investments or on assets. And I think valuation also it's a good it's a good metric to look at once in a while because it is genuinely the value of credit to For me, for example, Bombay Shaving Company's valuation today is was zero in twenty sixteen. It is what it is today and along the way. Yeah, no, have, it is. Shep, it's yeah. Well done. And people who have come along the way at every point have an opportunity to liquidate and make some money, including employees. So it's a good North Star, but it cannot skew with your sense of worth beyond a point. Yeah, you know what? I think that, yes, I, I think you're right. I think that there's this amazing book called Outliers, which I would highly recommend you read. Malcolm Yadgar. No, 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 no not, not that. No. Outsiders, outsiders, outsiders. Um, which is about 
a few companies, most of which I'd never heard about, but companies that had created disproportionate wealth in public markets. Okay. Uh, and it's all about how, number one, they focused, my key learnings, one, focus on cash flow. Mm. Right? Uh, deliver cash. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing that, you're doing something right. Correct. Uh, number two, deliver returns on equity. Uh, not today, tomorrow, but over three, four years, you've got to show you're going in the right direction. And number three, trade on your valuation. So the best, the people who've delivered the best have known when their stock is overvalued and sold, right? Uh, they've known when their stock is undervalued and they've, you know, they've held. But they've had, they've kept their heads on their shoulders uh, about where their valuation is today versus what is realistic. Correct. The worst thing you can do when your valuation is high is say, no, I deserve this. Yeah. And it's going to be double again. No, you should sell, man. Yeah. Right? Completely agree. Completely agree. And then a lot of, like, for founders, it's obviously very difficult. But for public markets, you're right. You're absolutely right. And a lot of, like, a lot of, lot of CEOs, I think, get it wrong also, right? Undervalued businesses, they think that, you know, buying back stock, reducing the float would be a good way to increase the share price. And these are all like this, you know, people see through this. The things so, done, if done for the wrong reasons, I think people see through this. I think that, I think if done for the right reasons, it's fine. Like mm -hmm. if your share price is genuinely undervalued and you're sitting on cash by the buybacks are in the context of India, that is slightly more tax efficient also. Yeah. Um, so I think if done for the right reasons, people appreciate it. I've also seen people who've just announced buybacks because, oh, it's going to drive my stock up by 10%. <laughs> well, it doesn't work because people see through it. And I think the interesting, I mean, the thing I've, under, I've understood... Doing stock corrects quickly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, I think if you're a well-traded stock, the market, you know, analysts very quickly understand what you stand about, what you stand for. Uh, and it really is an equation of trust with the analyst. At the end, the question is, does that person still believe that you will deliver what you are saying you will deliver? Right? Yeah. Numbers and all that stuff is is fine. Right? Yeah. But you and I have built enough Excel models to know that to know that on the margin, yeah. you can nudge them. Yeah. The question is, do I believe you and do I trust you? Yeah. And the worst thing you can do is to do a couple of things that break trust. Like a buyback, which is because I think my stock is undervalued now, I'm going to quickly do a buyback. Yeah. Uh, because I want to nudge my price up and then I'm going to sell. Yeah. They, they see through these. Yeah. But I think you just have to... Again, you know, one of the things I sniffed with public market analysts is they, they sense you're focused on your valuation. They become that much more worried. You made a very important point around balancing um, cash flow and return on equity, which are oftentimes correlated, but not every time. Why, why do you say that? Because I think public markets also, like, Cash indicators are immediate. Public market indicators are lagging. So, if one should lead to the other, but many times it doesn't. And there are other variables that come in. So, solving for both of them independently, I think, is a is good public market CEO practice. I completely agree with you. You need to. I think in the medium term, you have to have a path to both. And I'm not saying solve it quarter on quarter, but if you don't have a path to get to a decent ROE over a period of time, yeah. not list. You're right. Just it's, it's a period of time thing. Cash flow is not list. Completely agree. Completely agree. Um, what next? Like when you grow up? Da, da, da. <laughs> what next? Now that now that you are growing up, what next? So so I think I've we've spoken about Eka, but yeah, no, no. I mean, I think I've, I spoke about the myth of myth of meritocracy also. Yeah, <laughs> I think my third realization has just been that it has been about the tyranny of scale. Um. I think somehow, I don't know where and how, we've all somehow learned that if you don't do something that's worth a billion dollars, it ain't worth anything. Yeah. I mean, everybody is just chasing this. Dude, unicorns are mythical creatures. They don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> by, by definition. By definition. I want to be a unicorn. <laughs> like you don't, That doesn't exist. Yeah. I think one of the things I've learned for the last 25 years of professional life is that Quality is so much more important than skill. Yeah. In fact, I was watching you interview with Pramath. Right? Pramath is an outstanding example of somebody who's built quality and it's scaled to a yeah. large extent, but he's not trying to solve for India's problem. Yeah. But he's saying, I'm going to build institutions that are of quality and look at, look at the amazing work that yeah. they've done. Um, so I'm setting myself free of this, of the burden to build something that changes the world. 
uh, I hope whatever I do does change the world. That's not the that could have stopped the objective. I think the objective is to really build something that makes a difference. So with Eka, you know, if we launch a new batch every year, in seven years we'd have 200 kids or so. Uh, we may open in other cities over time if we think we can do it with quality. I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm actually okay with keeping it that small and saying hopefully these 200 kids will each make a difference to another 20 kids in their lives. And so over time, this will, this will snowball and I'm actually, I'm actually fine. How much time does it take of yours, Eka? About 30% of my time at this time. Biran will look at the I look at this and say no chance. <laughs> uh, but I think, Biran, yeah, I think about 30%. I think it, it's, it's spiky. So we do a summer, we do a, we're doing a summer camp with the kids every every year and I'm committing to going and being faculty at that camp for a week, for a residential camp. We do a, a day with them every month. Uh, I make sure I, but this, for this time I'm missing it because we're in Delhi. But I really, really want to make sure I'm there for all of them. Well, let me know if you want me to come over and kind of be a part of it. And Absolutely not. I wouldn't. You must that I'm a cult figure and all that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, no, no, okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. No, I will. Um, so I, I want to do that and I want to just figure out, I think that the question in my mind is what does it take? What does it really take to drive social mobility? There's some indicators which say in India it takes seven generations. Right? I don't know if that's true. I've not seen When you say social mobility, you mean like what does it take to allow a child who comes, who's, whose parents have not been to school and college, uh, maybe is on the border of food security, what does it take to get that child into a, into a career that gives them fulfillment? Right? I mean, everywhere. I'm not even saying everyone has to be in a white collar job. You, maybe you want to be a carpenter. Maybe you get fulfillment by making furniture. But then what does it take to get you to be a okay. damn good furniture maker? Uh, who takes pride in what you do and kind of right? How, how can we create inspiring leaders out of out of kids? Right? Uh, can we help them become inspiring? We can't create anything, but can we help them get there? So that's that's what I'm hoping to do with Eka, and that's really so my my thinking in the education sector. I also feel like sustainability is an area where um, where a lot more effort is needed now, yeah. and I think there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I've toyed with being an investor in the space again. I think I'm just too itchy in my fingers. And a lot of people have said, listen, that's how you're going to scale yourself. You become an investor, invest in lots of tools. But uh, again, I, I just feel I want to build something and I, I want to work with people. And um, so we're ex a, a friend and I from business, a friend from business school and I are, uh, are exploring whether there's a something interesting to be done in the reforestation space. Mm -hmm. India has been particular issues here because the cost of land is so high. Yeah. In many parts of the world, carbon credits can pay for it, but India yeah. doesn't look like it. And Correct. Land availability is also so low. It's a lot of complicated to acquire, no? Very complicated to acquire. Availability is poor. So we're doing a few things. More on that later if it works. I don't want to talk too much. So that's, that's I'm really, really enjoying it. You know, we just started a nursery for indigenous trees. Um, they're doing a bunch of exciting, interesting things there. Um... I spend a lot more time with my boys. I don't know if they like it. <laughs> uh, he's on his phone. Yeah. And I don't know if they like it, but you know, I I like it. Like I feel like I don't feel I fully understood the role of being a father until I started spending time with them. Really? Yeah. More time, and I've always been a relatively involved father on weekends. Yeah, but red eye two red eye flights a week. There is a limitation. Yeah, I'd come back a bit irritable. We still play a lot. Now, still, you know, we do lots of fun things together, but. But now I'm there without agenda, right? I'm just sitting around harassing them. And uh, I'm there when they actually need me. Now he's smiling. <laughs> so he is listening. <laughs> um, you know, I'm there without agenda and I feel that I can do more. I love the fact that I cook yeah. almost a meal a day for them. Uh, I try and make that happen. What's, your, what's, your, what's the best thing you make? So I can you ask him, what's the best thing your dad makes, man? What's the best thing your dad cooks? I don't eat child pasta is up. Pretty what you realize on memes. Pretty good Chinese food as well. Wow, that's that 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 that's a repertoire. This is why you have to come home. You yeah, I must. I love to cook for fish. Yeah. So we're one of the few Indians that have an island kitchen in our living room. In your living room. Yeah. So your right. kitchen and your living room are like kind of completely together. combined, and that's where we cook because when friends come, that's where we are. So we'll do pasta from scratch, like literally with from flour. Oh wow. Uh, I love cooking Mangalorean, like just my sort of. The food that you'd get in my home village if you were to go. 
Uh, I love cooking that. So kujje huli is kujje huli is like a kujje kathal, uh, and huli is like a coconut based sambar kind of thing. Or uh, so I, I I love doing Mandalorian food. Um, yeah, it's Asian too. Sounds like a sounds like a good life. I feel lucky. I really feel lucky. I must say it's it's interesting. I I've been through periods in my life where I felt extraordinary un extraordinarily unlucky. Uh, I've like been what? through periods where I felt like a complete loser. When the health issue happened, oh, when I turned forty, I was just unhappy with life. I mean, look at all these people who are out there: forty rock stars, CEOs, forty under forty, thirty under thirty, twenty under twenty, five under five. <laughs> <laughs> like none of these things. Like what? What a waste. Uh, so turning forty was tough for me. I just felt like I'd underaccomplished. Really? Yeah. As a senior part time McGinley. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. so I've been to these periods, right? Now I just feel, like, gosh, if I actually look up and look around, I am just like there is no capability I have that could justify the luck I've had, right? Just lucky. I actually think everyone in this room. Is extraordinarily lucky whether we choose to see it or not. But just being born to the place we're born, to have the education, like guys who who have the luxury of shooting, yeah, like that must be a passion, right? You're not doing it because yeah, your father said to bara okay camera chalai ni. <laughs> You're doing it because you want to. Yeah, that's your privilege. It looks so much luck. Yeah, I agree completely. I agree. This has been a fascinating conversation, Suraj, for me. I think. Uh, so good to kind of get to know you much deeper. One of the one of the biggest benefits for me doing this is I get to sit here and like kind of dig deep unapologetically <laughs> on uh, on intellectual, emotional topics um, with people who are who I respect deeply and who accomplish things that are uh, you know of course luck can justify some of it, but I think what you have achieved um, is is phenomenal. And what I think what what you are going to do for the next fifty years. Will probably kind of uh, surpass what you've done for the last twenty-five. So, uh, before we leave, I do want to uh, ask you, like our viewers are people who are, like I said, right on the fence, um, inspiration hungry, aspiration hungry, uh, and genuinely well intentioned to do something of their own or be a part of someone of 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 something which they are passionate about. Very words of. You know, kind of encouragement, advice, caution, wisdom, whatever. Yeah, look, I I think that where India is so opportunity heavy right now, everywhere you look, there's opportunity, right? I mean, if I was in rural India today and my father was a farmer, I think I would go and learn how to build water systems, because you know what, eighty percent of India's farmers are going to be drought prone in the next ten years. Yeah, you can't with climate change, right? We need more ponds. We need more water systems. And right now, you cannot find pond well experts who are who are scientifically trained. It's very mm. tough to find. Right? Um, there's a great business to be done there. Um, I think if you're in a city with all these people coming in, this they need food. They need because they need homes. They need so many things. Right? The opening a even opening a classic retail business, open a Kirana store and do it well. You're an entrepreneur, and you're you're adding value in the world. I I feel like the most important thing, and and when I talk to my sons, right, I I also realize that in that that generation, there is so much pressure to start something that is worth a billion dollars in six months. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. Take that pressure off yourself, because you know what? I think valuation is fate. What you can do is just build the best damn business that you can build. So if you Opening a Kirana store, be nice to your customers. Make sure you you stock what they want. Uh, home deliver stuff that's important to them. Your business will grow. Valuation will look after itself. Right? I think it's really important to understand why you're doing what you're doing. What your business is really meant to do. What really is the purpose of your business? And do that well. Everything else will look after itself. Awesome, Raj Morje. <laughs> it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. I think. Thank you so much for your time. And um, you know, uh, I would love to be a part of things that you do. I know that we talk about it on and off, but whether it's Eka or whether it's kind of um, the work you're doing on reforestation or whatever else you pick up, I have realized that, in fact, contrary to what we spoke before, I think one of the COVID realizations is, while life may be long and you might live hundred years, 
it is also unpredictably short. Suppose it can get cut short and in a moment, right? Um, so maximize opportunities to work with people on things that you know kind of turn you on and give you a joy. And I'm going to actively kind of do that. I think barbershop is genuinely something I enjoy doing. I have convinced my CEO that it seems to have some ROI on marketing. <laughs> and he kind of gives me the freedom to do this, but uh, it genuinely is something that I actively will seek and solicit a lot more. So I think we should work together. And um, that's why I kind of got involved with Olympic Gold Quest and with a lot of the other things with, with McKinsey again and so on. So we should work together and I would love to kind of be a part of whatever it is that you do. I think it's it'll be awesome. Thank you, Shantanu. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah. You're Thanks right. for having me. Were the notes helpful? The notes were kind of helpful. You're so sincere. You're looking at, <laughs> you're looking at them also. Yeah, I Every moment, then have I, have I, like, <laughs> something I'm not, I say something stupid I'm saying. It also tells me what not to say. <laughs> Thanks, Tun. I think Manan will be old enough to use it in maybe a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, he'll probably use a beer trimmer. Nothing growing. <laughs> this is our first product. Thank you so much. No, absolutely. My pleasure. Completely.